Well, hi everybody. This is Sunday the 19th of January and this clip will form part of a video that probably won't go up until next weekend, Friday or Saturday or something like that. But <clears throat> I just wanted to show you what I've been up to and I'll show you another clip later on hopefully showing that they survived this. But I got concerned about the, the peppers. They're really not big enough to be transplanting up into a larger pots yet. But the yellowing leaves on some of them got me thinking that I did use a real crap, cheap uh, potting mix to start them in, and that's what they were potted up in because I didn't have anything else at the time. Well, as I showed in my last video, I was able to get some of the good compost bags in the house. So I decided to move them up anyway into gallon size uh, grow bags. Got these on eBay, quite a deal really, I thought. Less than $12, $11 and something for 20 of them. And I've used a dozen of them here so far. I'll probably use some more later on in the spring with tomatoes or whatever. I've seen them in greenhouses before where, uh, I don't know, probably small shrubs or uh, small perennials or whatever growing in them. Um, they're really easy when it comes to transplanting something. You just take a box cutter and slice up the side and you're plant comes right out. Anyway, I give you a little scan down here. The number tags, once again, refer to the plant list below. I haven't lowered the lights back down yet. I'm just about to, to do that. So there they are, their first transplant, which I don't know, maybe their only transplant, I'm not sure. That's the broadleaf chives. I thought about transplanting them too, but they're just barely through the soil. So I've set them up on top of an inverted pot to get them up closer to the lights. So I will show you this again when hopefully all 12 of them survived. The hydroponic cucumber Rocky is still doing very well. I'm very pleased. I think the pruning off of the side branches and stopping the main vine from getting any longer has, along with the changing of the nutrients frequently, has encouraged it to let its cucumbers grow. Uh, Next to it, on the right-hand side there, that's a calendula, and I, it is growing. I'm just not so certain it'll ever grow up to, to bloom, but we will see. As I said, I've, I have removed all of the side branches so that the vine isn't going off in many directions. But at the base, one started to develop, and I almost took it off, and then I got thinking about it. The, the one that's producing the large vine there that's producing the cucumbers um, only has a limited amount of cucumbers on it left to develop. Quite a few, but still a limited amount. So I'm thinking that I will let that second vine continue to grow. And whenever it stops producing cucumbers from the main vine, I'll prune the main vine off. Anyway, I'm just about to harvest my second cucumber. Uh, the first one, when I harvested it, well, four or five days ago now, wasn't as large as this one is, but when I get in there and you see my hand in relationship to this one, it, uh, it is just about the size that they are when you buy them in the store. As I've said many times before, this is... Very, oops. <laughs> this is very similar anyway to the uh, um, variety that you get in the store. You find, I don't know, half a dozen or eight of them in a little pack with, uh, you know, sealed in plastic type thing for an astronomical amount of money. Three or four dollars, almost four dollars usually, They're like three ninety nine or something for half a dozen or eight of them. But, this one I'm growing is called Rocky. I'm not positive that that's the same one that you get in the store, but it's a very similar cucumber. And the one that I ate the other day was as good as the ones that came out of the greenhouse in the summertime. They're very flavorful and they're nice and crunchy in the salad. So anyway, I've at least got two cucumbers out of it and there's, oh, I don't know, probably a dozen more that are developing there. Whether they're all mature or not, I don't know. But that's what's happening with the cucumber vine so far anyway. Well, a few leaves have grown back on the parsley plant, so I can show you that this week. Uh, it's doing really well. I don't know how many times I've pruned leaves off and used them, but it's been great to have fresh parsley here in this miserable cold weather. Minus 15 right now when I'm 
filming this and a lot of wind so winter is not through with us yet I guess well, it's been four days since I up potted changed the size of the pots on the 12 pepper plants and uh, really they never looked back there wasn't any transplant shock or, or anything like that these grow lights I don't know make things look different than they are. They're not as yellowy green as they look under these lights. Actually some of the ones that I was concerned about are getting darker green now that they've been put into larger pots and better soil. But Satisfied with the transplant anyway. I guess now we'll go down to the kitchen and see if we can't make some maritime soul food. Dinner this evening I hope to have fish cakes. Fish cakes traditionally around here were the leftover next meal day after a dried fish dinner. And our preferred fish here is Pollock for a dried fish dinner. I guess that's showing up there. Uh, I can no longer get what they call slack salted Pollock around here. Slack salted dry Pollock which doesn't have as much salt as this has got. But this has an extreme amount of salt so it has to have a lot of that removed. But um, I'll show you here in a minute. It's a lot of salt in that. Uh, what I will do is uh, rinse it a couple of times in cold water and then I will put it on the stove with the burner at the lowest setting and over a two or three hour period I'll change the water two or three more times and that will remove 90% of the salt. You're probably still consuming a lot of salt but not enough to be really concerned about. And in our um, fish cakes we have onion. We put turnip, what we call turnip. The rest of the world calls rutabaga. I guess some parts of Europe, England, the United Kingdom calls it a swede. And potatoes. Um, uh, you can either boil or bake the potatoes. I'm going to bake these. And boil the, uh, the turnip, of course. There'll be some onion in it, and I'm going to have it with an egg gravy, uh, which may be something you've never heard tell of before. But all will become clear as we go on here. And as I'm not in the fish cakes, but with the fish cakes, I'm going to have squash. This is one of my winter squash out of the last summer's garden. I was just down in the basement getting potatoes and things. I still have four left and they're all good sized ones. They're keeping very well. They're not spoiling at all. The color has changed. It's a different color green. It was a much darker green but I suppose that's being out of the sunlight has, has caused that. But there's no sign of them spoiling at all yet. So, so far so good and they are delicious. So we'll move on here and I'll show you the steps that I go through to make uh, fish cakes. Well, I cooked the squash in the steamer, my rice cooker in the steamer basket. I tend to use my rice cooker for many things. I jokingly say I even cook rice in it sometimes, but it's probably the most used appliance in my kitchen. Anyway, the squash has been uh, cooked, mashed with butter and salt and pepper, and when I'm ready to eat I will uh, reheat some of that in the microwave and the rest will go in the refrigerator to be used for several days. Are you noticing a theme here with my cooking segments lately? They all involve my new potato ricer. <laughs> I never had one before and I love using the thing. So the turnip or rutabaga, whatever you want to call it. I cook that by boiling it in salt water. Salted water. Now I'm ready to go through the ricer. Not a lot of turnip compared to the ratio of turnip, potato, and fish. Turnip is probably only about 10 or 15 percent, I guess. Just there to add some extra flavor. The potatoes are still baking in the oven. So I think what I will do now is move on and make the egg gravy. Oops, water out of that old house. Because that shows up 
relatively well there. That's the turnip bowl processed through the ricer. Might as well add the onion. I put half an onion, that whole onion that you saw, half of it goes in the fish cakes and the other half will go in the egg gravy. So let's move over and try making egg gravy. Well, the egg gravy is a relatively simple thing. It's actually just a white sauce with hard boiled eggs and some onion in it. But cold egg gravy here. The other half of that onion. Partially cook it. Fresh pepper, and salt. Don't need a lot of salt in this meal. There's enough salt in the fish, I guess. Well, I'll come back in just a second when I'm ready to add the flour and milk. Well, the onions have softened enough. I didn't really measure the butter. It was probably a strong two tablespoons, I guess. And you add roughly the same proportion of flour, just ordinary white, all-purpose flour. So what you're making is a roux, really, I guess. A roux with onions in it. Just enough flour to absorb the fat. Seems to be about right. And cook it for a bit to get rid of the raw flour taste. Doesn't take much, just a minute or so. And then add milk. I'm going to start with a cup of milk here, add it slowly. Thick it gets, I may have to add more. Try to stir as I go to prevent it from getting too lumpy, but with the onions in there, it's hard to tell if it's lumpy anyway. but I don't think I need it. The flour will gradually thicken the sauce or the gravy. If it starts to get too thick, I can do that quite easily. It just thins back down again. But to that you add a couple of roughly chopped hard-boiled eggs. And that's why it's called egg gravy. Basically that's it. I can turn the heat off and uh, warm it up a bit more when I when I need it. The last of the potato ready to go through the ricer. It might be a good time for me to say that I don't intend to sit down and eat all of these. <laughs> they freeze very well. Uh, I will make them all up and I won't cook up the ones that I'm going to freeze, but I'll put them on a cookie sheet and uh, parchment paper and set them in the deep freeze until they're frozen and then bring them out and put them in small individual 
Ziploc bags and freeze them to a bag or so for for meals ahead, and they they're very nice when they're thawed back out. Well, that is the uh, turnip, onion, and the potatoes mixed together. I won't add any salt, but if I could find the pepper mill, I would grind in some pepper. And the fish is just about ready to be drained and uh, added to this mixture. I rinsed the fish off twice before I started to cook it in cold water to get rid of the salt that was on the outside of it. And then it has been cooking for a couple of three hours now on very, very low heat. And I changed the water twice while it was cooking. So it doesn't get rid of all the salt, but that gets rid of most of it. Maybe we'll come back in a minute when we're ready to make fish cakes. I've drained the fish and flaked it up into relatively small pieces here. It's still very hot. vegetable mixture here. So I'll continue mixing and I'll come back when this is cool enough to handle and make it into fish cakes. You certainly don't need to see me make fish cakes but I'll do one or two and then when I'm finished we'll fry them up and have some supper here. size handful I guess and your impeccably clean hands as Julia Child would have said. I'll come back after I finished here. Well there's a couple of them in the frying pan and I'm starting to get hungry. This is smelling pretty good. Everything in them is basically cooked well except for the, the onion and that will partially cook at least in the frying process here. So. The idea is just to heat them up nicely and get a nice brown crust on them. We'll come back when I have things plated up here. Well, dinner is ready to serve, I guess. The kitchen looks like there's a good chance there's been a terrorist attack, but other than that, everything's fine. A little of the egg gravy. And this is chow chow, um, a green tomato relish made with green tomatoes, of course. Uh, cabbage, I think I had some cucumbers in it this time, and some uh, green peppers and whatever, but anyway, it's traditionally eaten here with fish cakes. You can't have fish cakes without chow chow. Mm. If I must say so myself, quite good. I hope you'll give this a try. I think you can get salt dried fish most anywhere now. I know it's certainly very prevalent in, in Europe, especially in Spain and Portugal. Well, that concludes the little cooking segment here. Well, thank you for watching. If you remember, I said I baked the potatoes to before I put them through the ricer. Well, these are what I've done with the jackets, the skins. I uh, put uh, some ground pepper and sea salt on them and a little Parmesan cheese. I put them back in a hot oven for 10 or 15 minutes just to melt the cheese. And once they cool, they make a very nice snack. Well, thank you for watching.